This is the Dane Moore NBA podcast coming at you Saturday afternoon. It's September 28th, and whew, uh, we are uh, recording an episode uh, on a Saturday afternoon because on Friday evening, Carl Anthony Towns uh, was traded to the New York Knicks in exchange for Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, Keita Bates, Diop, and a predicted first-round pick from Detroit. I've got Kyle Tige here with me, um, and we'll get into all of those pieces I will start picking this thing apart today. We'll do it. We got media day on Monday. We got the we got the whole training camp, and there's <laughs> going to be a, a ton of stuff to 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 dig into. And quite frankly, I need some some time to be able to to fully uh, dig into it. But Kyle, I'm going to just kind of start blabbing here for a second. Uh, if you're cool with riding shotgun for the first few minutes uh, off the top of this, sounds good. Um, so, you know, uh, I was, I was in Wisconsin last night, uh, for like a (laughs) cabin weekend thing, uh, when the news broke and then, you know, got up, drove home this morning. So I really didn't really didn't until like an hour ago when I got home, I didn't really get a lot of time to like, look at my phone. And I'm sure you've, you've had this too. Like the most common text was, what do you think? (laughs) What, What do you think of the trade? You know? Yeah. Um, you know, and so I start rattling off like a handful of responses of, you know, oh, it gives them the ability to like resign Nas Reed in a year. Like how they really like DiVincenzo, you know, Finch coach Julius Randall in New Orleans, all that stuff. Um, but like, that's not what I've found myself thinking about in this, these, I don't know, 15 hours or whatever, since, uh, since the trade happened, it's what's actually like happened in my head when I've started like writing notes down about Randall or DiVincenzo or whatever. It's like, I've lost my focus a lot and I keep thinking about like the cat side of it. It it's actually been like kind of annoying. I, I, I'm usually pretty good with this stuff. I feel like about sort of just like drilling down into like, this is the story I have to write, uh, focusing on the pod I'm about to do. And I actually, I, I like that about myself in, in this job of kind of like compartmentalizing. And I think I'm kind of good at that. Uh, I, I grew up, I mean, obviously a lot of people listening to this know this, but I like, I grew up in Minnesota. I played basketball. So I was a, obviously a fan of the Wolves when I was a, was a kid, but, you know, doing this for a job, I've actually kind of enjoyed letting go of that and just kind of like training this job like a job, you know? calling balls and strikes. It's not of what's what's going on. I mean, not that I don't get emotionally involved sometimes, but I'm not really like, I try to not be like emotionally connected to the results of any success or failure of the Wolves. And honestly, like these last playoffs, I felt like really tested that for me because I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see myself feeling the same things. Maybe even I saw you feeling like in terms of what, it it meant for the wolves to to go to the western conference finals and stuff and i'm 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 actually cool with that i i i kind of prefer to you know to have it be my job and it's a fun job and it's great it's not like i've got like no fun or anything uh related to it but um the the cap piece is kind of different you know for for me in this because it's it's different than the western conference finals uh a year ago you know, for me, because when like I met Cat for the first time and I started, you know, writing articles about him, about his team, like I did, I did have that like emotional connection to the team. I mean, it was a, it was a long time ago. I started writing as you did, uh, unpaid uh, about the Wolves <laughs> for a blog just uh, for fun. I started that during the 2016 17 season, the first year of Tibbs, ironically. Uh, Cat and Tibbs' first year together in Minnesota. And I don't know if you remember this, but in that that 2017 summer, uh, after the season, someone from from like Cat's team reached out to me to see if I wanted to do a, a story on Cat. And the I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh like what's how does this work? Like, I'm not a journalist. I don't know what I'm like gonna be. I didn't say that in the email, but I that's what I was thinking. And uh, the, the plan, they were like, all right, Kat's doing a Kit Kat commercial that's being filmed at his house. And like, 
you can come and just kind of observe the commercial being filmed and you know and then kind of talk with cat while it's going on but then at the end you can do an interview with him and you know write a you know write some sort of story off of that um and if i'm being honest what i keep thinking about with this trade is i keep thinking about that day like that's where i am going back to in in my mind because again it was like the first real journalisty thing i ever did it was also the first time i ever talked to carl anthony towns and what is that like 27 seven years ago um seven years later now i've i've talked to carl anthony towns many 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 times um and it's crazy like my life has just changed a lot since then i i got into writing about the wolves just kind of as something to do as as you did too it was just like a, a fun thing we enjoyed doing i had no real intention of making it a job or anything but eventually it did become my job um covering the the wolves for various publications and platforms i i started doing that full-time in in 2018 probably like 18 months after that day I went to the Kit Kat commercial, <laughs> wrote that article uh, about Kat at his house. Um, and I'm really grateful that this has become my job and my life and the things I get to do with it. And I do wonder if that, if that day wouldn't have happened, if that team's star player wouldn't have been cool with me from that time going forward. I wonder if, if Kat, didn't have the respect he had for me or chose to give me the respect that he chose to give me if the wolves like organization would have chosen to give me you know mm -hmm. that respect over the years to kind of integrate into being part of the you know the wolves beat and the the funny thing is cat is really the only timberwolves employee that has worked there when i started covering the timberwolves and still works there or at, until yesterday you know still work there a lot of people have been fired um, over the years. A lot of people have moved on. A lot has just happened, but, and you know, I've written stories about it, done podcasts on all of it, all of it for crazy last seven, eight years. Um, but cat has always been the thing that, that has been there. And for, for me, it's going to be weird for, I think for everybody, but for me, it's definitely going to be weird to go to media day on Monday and have him not be here. Like mm -hmm. that was the one staple of, every wolf season of every little different iteration is like it was always like how is all this stuff gonna fit around cat everything else is new but cat is here and 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 it's like i don't want to say i have like a complicated relationship with cat but we're not just like buddies we're not like friends a lot of you listening to this you know have heard me talk about cat a bunch over the years and it certainly hasn't been all positive i mean there's been plenty of things that you know, make me roll my eyes about Cat's game or something that Cat did. And and then I think there's been plenty of things that I've written or said that have made him, you know, roll his eyes, probably ticked him off. But um, we've always kind of maintained a healthy professional relationship. I think I'd never lost like sight, even in things about Cat's game that I didn't think were going right or he was doing wrong. Like I never lost sight. I don't think of the, the fact that he was a great player. Um, even if I was rolling my eyes at time to time. And I think he always understood that, you know, I had a job to do that wasn't just like being a fan with a microphone. But I thought a lot today about that Kit Kat commercial day, you know, where I was there and I was just a fan with the microphone. Um, and it's just a trip, man. It's just, it's just, it's a trip. Robbie, we're going to talk about this trade today. We're going to talk about again on the show all week and everything. I'm sure we'll be breaking it down the entire season. But for those asking, what do I think about this trade? Like, that's honestly where I'm at right now is like struggling to kind of put pen to paper into even getting down to like the objectivity of like, okay, it is Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo and this Detroit first round pick. And it's, it's, it's not Carl Anthony Towns. I don't know if that's because that was in Wisconsin when the trade happened and just like kind of out of uh, my element, but that's, yeah, that's what I've been thinking about the trade. Well said, well said friend. Uh, I just want to, I got a little nervous there because if you would have started crying, I would have had nothing left <laughs> that differentiates me 
on the podcast beat. So thanks for not doing that. Um, you know, you're supposed to do these pods right after that stuff breaks. So I, I, you know, Dane was doing stuff with his friends and family. I was doing stuff with my friends and family. So apologies, this is coming out a day later. But one of the first things I wrote down, because I couldn't sleep last night, and that's probably because a lot of espresso martinis have caffeine too. But I also was just thinking about a lot of this, and uh, I'm glad we didn't do one right away. Sure. Just because to me it was, uh, you know, again, I, I think you're the best in the business because, as you pointed out earlier, it's black and white. Sexes knows it's very analytical. And then, then there's someone like me who cries on a live stream, but this isn't just a basketball transaction. And if you really want to be narcissistic about it, or you really want to be brutal, like you can just be, it is just, you know, it's a business, right? But I was thinking too, the same stuff you were like, I don't know. I don't know if this podcast exists eerily because of, you know, like without someone just, I've been doing this for eight years and Carl Towns has just been there. For eight years, you know, cats have nine lives. Carl's had nine seasons in Minnesota and uh, he's just been there every time. And there he I think he's a little online. I think he has listened to a podcast or two of ours. And uh, but there's just a very mutual respect. And it is it was when I was out last night and you see the breaking news, Minnesota Timberwolves. The only thing you could think of was like an ownership thing, because that's kind of the only thing that was on your radar. Sure. And you knew that this was possible. And we're going to get into you know, actually more likely that it was going to eventually come no matter what. But mm-hmm. I think the timing of it, not just on a Friday night at the end of September, 72 hours before media day, but coming off of, you know, the best season maybe in franchise history, all the summer about, you know, continuity and what they're trying to build. And um, you said it better than I could say it. But yeah, the, the Carl stuff for me from a fan perspective is like, I, he's he. He was the one constant, and maybe it wasn't always the winning that you wanted, right, from the first overall pick out of Kentucky, but he was the one constant during all those lean years where it's like, you know, do I write about Cat's coat drive or do I talk about the Alexi Shved signing? It's like, I don't really want to do that, so I guess I'll talk about Carl some more. Right. Um, and, and I think this is big, and this is one of my questions to you to kind of kick it off or just something I wanted your sure. opinion on because you are Minnesota. You played basketball there. You're very ingrained in the culture and the community and all that stuff. And I was born on the border, so I try to adopt that state. But uh, it ma- and I'm not speaking for all fans. I'm speaking for myself. But it matters in Minnesota when you embrace it. And I think of all Carl's flaws on the court, maybe some off the court stuff, whatever. He embraced it, and it sounds so silly, but like he wanted to wear the Mitchell and Ness throwback jerseys and shorts. Like he wanted to. When he got to Minnesota and he was drafted by Flip and, you know, Wiggins and Levine stuff come through, he wanted to turn what was a fucking dumpster fire burning as hot as it could be. He wanted to turn that thing around. And that matters because now it is turned around, you know, and like uh, I just got back from brunch and I was looking at my garage and I have like this love sack and I've had the love sack for 10 years, like as long as I've lived out here. But it was like the coolest piece of furniture for my little shitty apartment for all these years. And then my wife and I got a house. We move into this house and the house is awesome. It's got multiple levels and we got all new furniture. And it's like the love sack still in the garage because it's kind of all I've ever known. And (laughs) will it it make it upstairs to the living room? Not if my wife can can help it. But uh, it's just it's it was it was one of those moments where basketball aside and i do think there is a ton of really fascinating basketball stuff to talk about here um and again maybe 15 minutes and it would be nice to say that conte towns is 28 years old who's he gonna make a half a billion dollars and he's not dead so we're not yeah, eulogizing yeah, yeah, right, him right, right. Yeah, but uh he point. he he has you know for his flaws he has been the one constant in my coverage of doing this and i don't know if i'm doing this with you i don't know if this podcast yeah. is as big as it is if he doesn't help stick around to kind of see it through when so many others just fly over country, right? So many others just came in and then left and he kind of wanted to make it work. So, uh, that's good. The utmost respect to him. And it was when people texted me, what are your thoughts on the trade? I mean, I, I speak for you here on this one too. Like you knew eventually financially something would come with this roster, but I was flat out stunned 10 out of 10. Yeah. Let's, let's get into why it happened and and what they got back right 
Yeah. Um, I think the the why it happened and maybe why it happened now is they were able to get a return that was a clearly positive return for Carl on a four-year, $220 million contract. The most expensive, I mean, he's the highest paid player in the league this season. Um, it's hard to be the highest paid player in the league and have your contract be viewed as a positive asset, right? It's, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, Jalen Brown just won finals MVP. You know, if he was just like on the open market <laughs> yeah, to, and he's on the same contract as cap, right? Like that return wouldn't be, it wouldn't line up with what we would associate with the finals MVP, but you know, for, and I'm not saying everybody needs to be a the salary cap like dork with this stuff. I know I certainly am not that with like I love football and I don't pay attention to the salary <laughs> cap and that at all. Um, but th- it's it's such an important piece of context in the the NBA trade sphere, right? You you can't just or obviously front offices don't just look at like these two players for this player or these two players for that. You know, it's it's not the players. It is always the players and then the subtext is always where they're at in their contract status and then it's about how that contract you know fits into their books overall and carl's on the most expensive contract possible and is not one of the very best players in the league so there was a concern i mean we've talked about this a hundred times on here mm-hmm. that would you ever be able to trade that for a positive asset return and they did that right like you got a first round pick. It's not a great first round pick. You know, it's protected, but that's a, you know, that's a piece that they can, you know, use in a trade. And then this DiVincenzo con- contract is certainly a, a, a positive piece. I mean, you think about what a lot of these numbers are coming in, even for just like role players this summer, like the guys getting 20, $25 million a year. Well, DiVincenzo's making 12 a year for the next three years. Like that's, that's a positive asset. Oh, J- Julius Randall, part of this, like, honestly, I, like I got to do more research into what his injury status is, even his game, like better acclimate myself with that. But what we do know is he is on a contract that isn't necessarily expiring after the season, but very well could expire. He's a player option for the following season for $30 million. And if he has any semblance of a decent season, he would opt out of that $30 million. So as to sign a bigger contract, whether it be with the wolves or elsewhere. Right. Um, so that the Randall part to me is relatively neutral in, in terms of, you know, the, the asset that you're taking back. So I'm looking at that as a pile of stuff back from the Knicks. It's not, it doesn't make me go, wow, like, whoa, like this is going to be awesome on the team. But that is that pile has a plus sign on it in terms of, of asset value. And if you're the wolves, you needed that because because if you eventually had to trade Carl as a negative asset, that would be brutal, you know, right? You'd be the because it's his contract and the other contracts are strip mining this team, given how far they are into the luxury tax. Like the reality of the situation was if they did just continue to roll with Carl into the future, you're just going to slowly start losing surrounding pieces. It's very likely that they would have lost Nas Reed next summer if they mm-hmm. didn't create some additional clap cap flexibility almost certain they would have lost Nikhil alexander walker and it just would have kept going from there as time would have gone on because they would have still stayed so high in overall team salary because you do have cat on a super max and ant on 30 percent max and rudy on like 34 percent max like it's just cat 35 percent rudy 34 percent ant at 30%, that's 99% of the cap right there to, to those, to those three players, you know? So it just, it, it, it was going to have to happen at, at some point where you were going to need to create additional cap flexibility, the difficult part. And it seems to me from what I've been able to gather from being online is the pain of it is even if people acknowledge that that cap flexibility was important, it sucks to make a cap flexibility move right now after you went to the Western right. conference finals and um, you know, theoretically have a chance to be a contender this season. So again, just speaking for one, one fan perspective here, but I, I would say that was probably, I mean, the biggest 
frustration is what we just did 20 minutes on, right? The, the Carl Anthony Towns Timberwolves eulogy of he's kind of been here for as long as a lot of people have been fans of, you know, a decade of Timberwolves basketball. Uh, um, but outside of losing that player and that person in the community and in the locker room and on the court and in the city, it's the timing of it is what I kind of took away as the biggest frustration point. Why now? You know, like, how do you feel if, about that? Like I you mean, personally, uh, my initial reaction when my wife asked me and when my dad called me today was every time someone says, what do you think about the timing of the Carlton town straight? I think of Tim Conley. And I think that Tim Conley, since he arrived, when he arrived a couple of years ago as like the new, you know, big game hunter, uh, brought in this top five exec, I said at the moment, like, he has the easiest job in the league right now. Just like when Tibbs came in that first time, like, you, if you are an executive, you can just come in and get a year to just chill, pimp out your office, make some money, buy a nice house. Like, you can just kind of watch the ingredients and see what you got. And then a year after it, your, your team probably sucks. And then you make your move. He didn't do that. He just came in and then six weeks later made the biggest trade since the Garnett trade. Right. Sure. And he did it on his time. And then it was like, okay, they, they're all in. Now they have to extend D'Angelo Russell. And he didn't do it. And he waited until 12 hours before the trade deadline and held kind of teams over a barrel mm -hmm. and then made another trade on his timeline. And then you get into the summer with the Nas Reed stuff, right? That was the next domino. It's like, okay, they're going to lose Nas, whatever. He, and once he gets on the market, like two words, a lot of money. And at the 23rd hour, like he signed Nas Reed. So for this one, again, it's like you would have thought, okay, maybe he's going to play this all the way out till the trade deadline. Maybe he's going to play this all the way out till the summer. And in an inverse, but once again, he did it on his timeline. And, you know, 48 hours ago, Tim Conley could have burned down a forest and I would have been like, well, we probably didn't need more space. And I, you know what I mean? And so I think that's what people are wrestling with too, is that, you know, outside right. of Wendell Moore, like he hasn't really missed. So mm -hmm. there's this trust of like, do I just continue to trust him? This does reek regardless, right? Like there's so many levels to this. This was a fin a financial move or this was a salary dump. I mean, some of that's kind of true, right? Like, I mean, to levels of, you just kind of painted the picture of how much that salary is. And it's not just, Dane, losing a Nas Reed next summer or losing a Nikhil, but stuff I don't really love talking about, but like this second apron and the new CBA, it's also you're not having the ability to even replace them in right. a sense or add real stuff. Like that's why the Dillingham move has to happen because it's like this is our last even potential shot at adding talent. So it is a business, and that's probably why Carl now is going to live in New York. Uh, and it was nasty, and it was oh, 24 hours after the team was like, oh, welcome back, 32, you know, big purr. But from a fan perspective, too, I also get, you know, it is a business, and people that, like, are don't want to have season tickets anymore, don't want to support the team. I think all of that is just the emotional part of it, but from the time that they decided to do it, 48 hours before, I mean, media day was probably going to be a celebration <laughs> of, like, hey, guys, welcome back from a great Western yeah. Conference on strip. Um, it's going to be much different, but back to Tim Connolly, he is not here to do anything other than win. <laughs> and I think in his mind, emotions aside, because he's not an emotional guy, he's really good at this, but he's also cold hearted. Like this is the best time to make the best move with the Knicks, you know, adding some stuff to the, to the offer. So yeah, the timing was wild, but I wake up this morning, I go to bed tonight thinking like, I'm just going to, blindly trust that man until i really see them slip up i, I want to keep uh keep going in this and i want to just talk about how much it will in, impact winning uh quickly let's let people know that uh this show is is brought to you by falling knife brewing company um and falling knife is hosting wolves fest um on october 19th kind of like 3 p.m to to 7 p.m uh it's a few days before the season starts on on the 22nd and uh, myself and Britt robson will be there uh, hosting a, a live show and kind of just taking part in in the festivities uh, in, in advance of that. So uh, we've been kind of uh, mentioning this on a, a few different episodes uh, recently, but want to want to keep that uh, on your radar and and just falling knife in general on your radar as the season uh, starts here because they're showing all the games and they're the they are the Minneapolis 
the bar in Minneapolis or the brewery in Minneapolis that you can uh, watch the Wolves. They're, they're committed to this and, uh, you know, they're committed to, to the show as well. So we'd love to see you all uh, following Knife Brewing Company on October 19th. They are uh, releasing a beer called the Second Apron that day for the for the event, which will be uh, which will be fun. Uh, so yeah, that's Fine Knife Brewing Company, Northeast uh, Minneapolis. Also consider uh, going out there for uh, to watch a Lynx playoff mm. game as well. They'll have those they'll have those on uh, on their big screens and projector screens and all that uh, in there uh, in there as well. All right, Kyle. Um, let, let let's talk about. Let's talk about how this is going to impact winning now. And I've been actually somewhat trying to stay away from like looking too much at that at other people's like analysis of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I did see I did see John Hall. I did read John Hollinger's piece because he's just kind of does a good job of particularly when it's something salary cap related, kind of being able to put that into basketball terms for me. And he's he mentioned in in his piece that uh, this actually this trade boosts the Wolves three wins this season uh, in in his model, along with getting the cap flexibility that it gives them and along with getting uh, the, the draft pick that, that the Wolves got there as well. And, I mean, three wins kind of sounds like a lot, but I, I can get behind the idea that it could be a neutral sort of move i mean there's going to be an acclimation process of putting in new pieces you're losing continuity that's going to cost you some but we go back to all the time of the disappointing part of last season right was that the offense just wasn't very good the wolves did not mm -hmm. have a very good offense last season and that's not because carl anthony towns is a bad offensive player or that anthony Edwards is a bad offensive player but that group that had a dream season really struggled to play offense at an even you know mediocre level obviously they were elite elite defensively um but I, I think people will look at the addition of randall and divincenzo and see that as an offensive denigration right like that the, the team got worse worse offensively and and i'm not sure that's going to be true because the status quo the the, the thing we were assuming as of yesterday to be was had a ton of questions uh, about the offense. I mean, we were both in the boat, like it was going to get a little bit better this year. There's ways they could get more chemistry between ant and, and cat back together. And there was, they could space the floor differently and do this and that. But this group has been together for a while and has struggled with two seasons, right? I know cat's been in and out and injuries and stuff, but has never caught an offensive rhythm so to that end, it's hard for me to see the offense with the new guys being that much worse than than what last season's team was. And while Cat was very helpful defensively in the playoffs, which obviously that's no small feat, guarding Durant and you know kind of being part of that double with uh, Rudy on Jokic. I don't I don't think you you look at Cat and you at go cat to Randall or cat to whatever the wolves new plan is going to be at the four Nas Randall, whatever, some combination and be like, Oh, that's a huge step backwards defensively by letting Carl Anthony towns go. I mean, obviously I'm doing a little glass half full here, but there's a way that by pulling out the cap piece, adding these two pieces and kind of redistributing the wealth in terms of salary cap and just like the ball uh, that this could, that this could be a more balanced out thing that is kind of greater than, than the sum of its parts. Do you think it's, do you think it's crazy to think that the wolves without cat and these new pieces in could be better offensively this year than they were last year? No, I don't think it's crazy at all. And Hollinger does a really good job with, with those articles and those projections. This is, less scientific but i thought it was really interesting jace frederick our friend had tweeted this out but that the wolves title chances before the cat trade mm -hmm. were plus 1100 so 11 to 1 odds yep. to win the title they make the cat trade their odds now are 10 to 1 which again kind of backs up this idea of and this is why you know you did the first segment on the emotions and now you pivot into the basketball stuff of like it it might hurt for a long time and you might 
actually never get over it <laughs> fully. Sure. But they also might just be better. And that, that, that will take my brain a little time to kind of get over and figure out. But I, I, when I was seeing the details of that trade come in, like you said, that Pistons pick is pretty heavily protected or mildly protected as it goes throughout the years. And that's a Pistons team that you just never really know if they're going to get out of the cellar. Sure. But I looked at it through my very smooth brain of the DiVincenzo piece is nasty. <laughs> like that's just like take take out the Carl emotions and take out the Randall stuff like him or not like him like that's just a guy that I mean you, we, we were forced spoon fed had to watch a lot of Knicks games last year on national TV he was awesome like he yeah. is I mean the the Villanova boys I think there was a lot of love for a Brunson who you know deserved it and some of the other guys but he was incredible like I think he made you might have this on you. I should have wrote this down like 280 some threes last year. And I don't think anyone in Timberwolves history has ever made right. more than 240. Like Bomb he is going, good. he is going to come in and be awesome. And he's got a little nasty streak in terms of trying to defend on the other end. So now you put that in a backcourt with an Anthony Edwards and a Jaden McDaniels and a Nikhil Alexander Walker and some of these other maybe younger guys. We, we joked about it. my burning question the other day on our live show, uh, of how will Carl and Ant fit together this season uh, was answered pretty quick. But we did talk <laughs> about at some point, once this roster became too expensive, this kind of pivot towards just, I mean, I know it's weird to say this, Dan, right? With, with Carl going up, like more shooting and more athleticism and just getting up and down and even more defense. And the Randall piece to me is I still got to figure out. I mean, he is in the last year of a deal before a player option next summer. He doesn't make as much as Carl. Um, he's probably not as good as Carl. I don't know how he fits with Rudy and all that stuff, but I, that that was the first takeaway for me. I was like, okay, you're losing this. Let me grieve. What are we getting back? And the DiVincenzo piece, I mean, you've said this before, they wanted him last summer when he was a free agent, but I just think that he can play so many roles. And, you know, it was Anthony Edwards' team 48 hours ago. I don't think that was up for debate, but now it's, now it's his city and his franchise and his parking lot and his practice facility. I mean, everything now is being funneled around what is going to make this have the greatest, you know, 10 to 1, 8 to 1, 6 to 1 chance of winning a title because they have clearly, and we already knew this, but they solidified it late Friday night. This is all about how do we put the best pieces around Anthony Edwards. Yeah, and I, I don't think it is viewed internally as a move that takes them out of contention this season to whatever degree of contention they were at, like, you know, yesterday, I don't think they would have made a move that removed them, you know, from contention. I think that those are the boxes they were trying to check was, can we trade Carl as a positive asset? Yes, this deal did it. And deep, the addition of DiVincenzo, which as I understand it, he kind of got added to the mix more recently and what's kind of reinstigated these uh these these trade talks you got you got the positive asset and you got pieces that they believe can replicate the production that carl gave but in new different ways like julius randall's not going to be able to do all the things carl anthony towns does but it is julius randall and it is divincenzo and it is cap flexibility to make other moves even during the season right now you have this detroit pick that you could trade during the season to, to upgrade your roster when previous, previously you had you had no assets. I like what you just like you said before when you referenced the the D'Angelo Russell lack of extension and the eventual decision to trade him. Right, that move that move came with like a little bit of a cost to the locker room of just waiting to the trade deadline to trade him because it was just a very disjoint, disjointed start of the season. It was the first year of Gobert. Right. And and things were things were rocky. The Gobert thing wasn't hitting. D'Lo was looking for an extension, didn't get it and wasn't want wanted an extension or wanted to go. And it was all just kind of being dragged through the season. And it was year one of the Gobert trade was tough. Right. But with patience, they ended up being able to flip D'Lo for Conley and Nikhil Alexander Walker, which if you don't do that, I don't think you get to the Western Conference finals, you know, this the, the season after that. And I think it's going to be the same if this works, right? And it could fail. This could end up being a bad move, right? But if it works, I think that's how we're going to think about it. 
where it's six months, nine months, 15 months down the line from now where things start making sense that they were able to do because they traded cat now, much like there were things they were able to, it, it changed by waiting to trade Delo till the trade deadline. It opened up the Mike Conley possibility. And I think that's, it's that same sort of ethos that the front office is trying to bring here of like that flexibility and seeing what that, where that can take them and assuming it's going to be a path that leads you to a better place than the path that you are going to be on, which had a very direct result the trapped in cap hell but maybe a chance of winning a championship this season. You know, like they just, they waited out and they they chose that path. I think it's also important to say this. Again, we've we've grieved a little bit. If you're listening to this, we're about 40 minutes in. Like hopefully now it's like, okay, we're starting to figure out the basketball piece a little bit more. I brought up a lot of the timing that Tim Conley has done in his timelines and on his, you know, whatever. But you brought up something. This isn't, it was shocking Friday night, but it's not just a guarantee that if they would have, not done this right now that they would have had offers like this whatever you think about the offer like they wouldn't have had this wasn't just a guarantee that like well 12 months ago everyone said that they would have to attach picks to unload carl to mm-hmm. save money and now like they got this like what if we would have waited six more months now you could have got like that's not a guarantee i mean there's injury. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think people really understand that in many ways again given what carl's contract was this was a sell high of cap bingo that's what i'm trying to say yeah yeah, yeah like it it was, and, and and you cannot like what that package is if we're just playing 2K, but in terms of the asset valuation, this was a sell high, at least significantly higher than the offers were six months ago, 12 months ago in the time, just because of the contract was such an issue of the contract, not to mention like Carl has struggled with injuries recently. What if Carl, in year one of his Supermax contract this season, had another serious injury? Now you're you're running a risk of going down like a John wall type situation, you know, with, with Washington where you're just kind of stuck. You can't move that contract because the players hurt. Um, and you're just kind of then waiting for that deal to expire. And given that they had Anthony Edwards, I didn't think, I don't think the idea of even considering that risk was let's, Let's let's okay. pile on. Let's make it even more doomsday. Again, this is a real thing, even though you might not want I don't even want to accept right now. But and I want Carl to go out and have great health. But I'm not a huge New York Knicks fan, but like I want him to go out and just ball out. Because again, of everything we just talked about. But he if he does stay and he does get injured again, and it's a it's a longer one, and now next summer you have no power forward because he's on the shelf, and now you've lost Nas Reed because mm-hmm. your your books are still cooked. And 25, 26 season starts and you suck because you've lost talent and not all your guys are healthy. And in December, Anthony Edwards says, bleep this. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I'm out of here. Sure. So that sounds terrible. But you've also, if you're listening to this podcast, have followed this team enough or followed the league enough where those dominoes do usually happen. And I've talked all summer thinking Carl was going to be here that this team might take a half step back because of like the Dillingham piece, or maybe they focus a little more on preserving some of these guys that have an injury mm-hmm. history. And now it's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe they do take a step, half step back, but man, if you wake up today, all emotions aside, the one thing I think is guaranteed from this deal is flexibility. Now all of a sudden you have this team that I think, you know, some of the people that graded this didn't always love it for the Wolves side, but I think it was like Partnow or whatever. Seth Partnow said, this is, a deep, this is the deepest team in the league now. Yeah. Like, sorry, Boston, but like this bench, all of a sudden you and I were trying to do ninth man. I mean, your bench now is probably yeah. for game one, Nas Reed, Nikhil Alexander Walker, Dante DiVincenzo, Rob Dillingham, Joe Ingles, Terrence Shannon Jr., Josh Mine. I mean, you're a 12-man rotation. That's never going to happen. But, um, and yeah, the Randall piece, I'm, you know, is he the starter night one? We'll, we'll see, right? We'll see how this all integrates. But he just seems to me, Dane, like a means to another another move, a means to another end. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. But you broke, you've broke. you always talked about this, dude. You're breaking up a really big contract into smaller contracts that make it more. I mean, Dante DiVincenzo, whatever you think about Randall's contract and his player option next summer, Dante DiVincenzo signed for three more years. on a, I mean, that is a really good player that would be on any contending team in the league. 
and now he's on your team as part of your kind of core and age group. So, uh, and again, and somebody that you could trade for a first round pick. Posi- <laughs> yeah, or you know, you connect him to somebody else to make another move. Maybe, maybe even it's him and Randall that you trade for for something right. else. It's again, it's this idea of having assets that do not have the risk of going so deeply negative that you know you can't you can't move them at all and cats had that risk that that was the risk of of keeping cat is that you know it it wouldn't ultimately get you there and in the process you know kneecap you in in some way whether that's just nas reed walking or something darker you know coming from that of just like being bad and not you know not again like the the john wall situation um but isn't, I, that, isn't yeah. that why it makes it so fascinating, back to the timing of it? Because, again, I said when Tim Conley got here, he had the easiest. He could have just done nothing for 12 sure. months, and everyone would have been so happy because the Wolves got a top mm-hmm. five exec. Again, in this moment, he could have just done nothing, <laughs> right? The run it back to her again and figure it out. I mean, I'm good at three things, man. Unload the dishwasher, making omelets, and procrastinating, and probably in that order. He could have just waited. He could have just said, you know what? This is so fun. Everyone loves me. You know, we got probably new ownership coming in. Like, let's just, we'll, we'll figure it out next spring. Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't do it. So it stings more. But in terms of also flexibility, like, I think being proactive, It's this is like a football thing, but I always think of Belichick with his quote was like, I'd rather get rid of a guy a year too early than a year too late. I mean, that's a big, mm-hmm. like, motto in professional sports. Because if you try to, and again, I hope Carl plays until he's 40. But if you try to get rid of a guy a year too late, you're mm-hmm. back in that cycle of attaching assets that you already don't even have. So that is another thing of like Tim Conley, man, is probably the most cold, not cold hearted, but just that's a that's a ruthless move to make when it could have been Kumbaya on Monday. And you're like, actually, I'm going to not just upset the apple cart. I'm going to blow that thing up to the moon. He, he's going for it. What, and, and that being like what he thinks the best past, path forward is. And he's done that same thing with the going for the go bear trade. All of all of the moves he's made, you know, I feel like I actually think, and maybe part of it is just that he got paid out so well that he's just kind of like, I'm like, I'm going out how I'm going out, like I'm going out on my own terms, and and I'm gonna do this my way, and it, not, I don't mean that like he's treating it like flippantly, but like I don't think Tim Conley had fear about the Go Bear trade. He was just kind of like, all right, you know, obviously there's a chance. I, I believe the go bear trade is going to work, but like, obviously there's a chance it doesn't. And if I go down, I went, I went out doing things the way that I wanted to do it, making a move that I believed was right, given the, how the chessboard was laid out in front of me. And I think he's done that like every step of the way, like he hasn't like sat on his hands. If he didn't feel like sitting on his hands was, was the right thing. And, and I think this is part of the uncomfortable element of this you know discussion because there is a loyalty element of of cat we've done all this but like they ultimately didn't believe that you the person out there say it's you kyle and you're just really upset and think it's really wrong that they made this trade like the reality and i know there's a lot of people out there i'm not even saying you're wrong you might be proven correct down the line but they don't share that opinion of carl anthony towns they don't it's not that they don't believe in Carl and Anthony Towns. They just look at it and and lay it out and assess a best, best path forward. And clearly, by making this move, they are not some of the biggest believers in Carl Anthony Towns in the NBA. That's just a that's just a fact of the matter. And they saw things that didn't work or weren't working smoothly in terms of how Carl integrated in with with rudy gobert or or ant not that those guys weren't friends and cool and all that sort of stuff but like ultimately thought that they could get something better out of that piece that is cat than they they got in cat and i i commend that i commend the like so you know in in fantasy football you should like the the player if you are the highest on that player in the in, in your league you should have that player on your team mm-hmm. if you know somebody else in your league is higher than you on Kyron Williams you should trade them Kyron Williams because they're going to give you back more value and i think 
I think that's how they're looking at this, you know, is it's not that Carl was bad. It's that we believe there's something can be better out of this because we don't we weren't fully bought in to what this future looked like with Kat. That's my read on the situation. Yeah. And I wasn't really I never thought of that. And I guess I was never really privy to that type of take or, or actual analysis. But for nine months, I just, you know, tweeted out, look how far we've come, friends, like all this stuff. Right. And there's a real chance that deep inside that building, the smartest people that I, I've said many times I trust thought, actually, this is as far as we can come with this. <laughs> like, like there is no next level for this. And mm-hmm. it, it, not, not to tarnish what was an absolutely magical run, even though it ended in kind of maybe there should have been more. But maybe they thought, like, actually, if you go back and look at it and the injuries kind of luck we did have compared to the first year of the Gobert experiment and round of the league and their injuries and all this stuff like maybe that was that one you know doctor strange moment was like this is probably as good as we can get with this and if we do try to run it back it might only give you know it might only pay out 80 percent you know what that reminds me of after after, yeah (laughs) no after the memphis series yeah yeah that Mm -hmm. that was and they said as much after the fact was and the the wolves played the grizzlies in in the first round and that team like had exceeded expectations and was really fun that year but they blew it up to go get rudy gobert because they thought that iteration of the cat ant jared vanderbilt jade mcdaniels patrick beverly team was at its ceiling of of where it could go and so again i don't know i haven't talked to him they haven't said that to to me specifically but i would assume that type of logic is is being applied to, to this situation. Uh, well, now that doesn't mean they necessarily think like, okay, well, Julius Randall raises the ceiling, but it's the optionality, uh, optionality that comes with it. And, and the DiVincenzo piece, like I just, they clearly believe in this path uh, more than they did the, the previous. Uh, quick aside on that, yeah. what you just said. Um, <laughs> this is why, after the Wolves lost Game 82 to the Suns, and I saw some people in the city say, do we even have to go to these next playoff games? Thinking that the Wolves had just kind of shit down their leg again. Uh, this is why you go to the fucking games. And this is why you embrace a moment. And this says now maybe nothing to do with basketball. This is why you kind of live in the moment. Because I, I've always referenced this, but it's always stuck in my mind. The Oklahoma City Thunder with... Harden and Durant and Westbrook all standing on the sideline in Miami when they're about to lose that finals and everyone on the broadcast saying they're going to be they're going to be here for a while like what a what a fun trio they're going to keep coming back and keep coming back that trio was a little better than Ant Jaden and Vando in Memphis right yeah. but this is why you go to games this is why you feel emotion and you cry and you laugh and you hug strangers and get tattoos on your lips because it do, it, it you're, you're not promised anything in this life now I'm p- pivoting to a TED talk, but like that's that was imagine the the stones it must take to just be like, we have all of this and I think it's completely at a dead end. Well, everyone else is like, wow, we can build off this. We can build off right. this and Olympics, Jaden, more offense, like shout out to Brit. I know we talked about his article a lot. A lot of that stuff out the window. I'm <laughs> um, just all of it. <laughs> right. Uh, I can't wait for the Tim Connolly piece in the photo op. Um yeah. It's just, this is why, this is why sports are awesome. And I inject myself into it because it makes you feel so many things. And who knows? Like, this is why, again, the ant stuff, I have no fear about Anthony Edwards wanting to leave or any of that stuff. But you can't sit here with a straight face and say it's never going to happen. You can't, you can't. Like, every other player in the league at some point gets out. So you have to maximize. Normally, right around 28, right? Right yep. where Carl uh-huh. is. Like, you think about Paul George, Blake Griffin, Kevin Durant, all those guys. Like, when they left their place that they've been, it's it's kind of at that time. And I think as a team, particularly if it's a superstar player, you're always, like, trying to fight that battle of keeping them beyond that or or needing to pivot. Um, and I, obviously the hope with Anthony Edwards is that he's going to be one of the greatest players of all time. And, and you need to do every single thing you can to ensure that he won't be another player who leaves when he's 27 or 28 years old. And I think a lot of this move is about that, man. I really do. hundred percent is, is there's just a risk. 
there yep. was just there was just a risk that 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 came with with not having a, a flexibility around him. And there's other things that could you know go right or go wrong in that process there. But much like Rudy Gobert is in Anthony Edwards' way when he drives to the basket, sometimes Carl Anthony Towns was in the way and the salary cap mm -hmm. for, for Anthony Edwards. And and that's, that's just a reality, you know, a reality of the situation. And they're trying to navigate, you know, something else out of there. And um, it makes sense to me. It does. Uh, I think I texted you that we, there would be no math, but I feel if I was listening to this, even if it's just a basic level, can we quick talk about the idea of this just being a salary dump or what the numbers, if you've run them yet of like, you're, you're bringing yeah. in, you are bringing in a little less salary. So like the luxury tax payment that was going to be historic is still going to be pretty large, but it, it is going mm -hmm. to come down. Right. Yeah. Well, we, we, we do kind of need to, to see what it, what it comes in at. I mean, Carl makes 50 this year. DiVincenzo plus Randall make a combined 40. Okay. Um, then you got Bates Diop in there. That's another two or three. So you're saving seven million. This, if that is what the final, like, I don't think the deal is totally finalized yet. Like, but we, yeah, yeah. But, but the Wolves are taking less in than they're they're sending out, right? And that's a they have to do that because if you're the second eight brand, you can't take back more than, um, right? Then you can take back more than than you send out so yeah it saves like seven million and probably in luxury tax dollars um probably another 20 million it would would save them if that's what the gap ends up being there uh but they were in a place to have like a hundred million dollar mm -hmm. over a 100 million dollar luxury tax bill so again those loose numbers if it's nice to save 20 million dollars from your luxury tax bill but it's still an 80 million dollar luxury tax bill which would still be the second highest luxury tax bill in the nba this season only behind the boston celtics i believe so i don't i don't really see it as a a cost saving move in the immediate because while 20 million dollars is a crazy amount of money to us that's not really like uh that's relatively small potatoes um, in, you know, in terms of a, a MBA organization that's worth billions of dollars, it is a cost saving move in, the, or could be a cost saving move into the future because what could happen is, you know, Randall opts out of his player option in a year. And now instead of paying cat 53 next season for the 25, 26 season, all you're paying is Devin DiVincenzo's 12. And you've then now you're totally out of the second apron. You've saved, you know, 40, 50 million dollars. But even then, I don't see that to be a cost saving move because I would assume that money goes to Nas Reed. Right. And and or Nikhil Alexander Walker. Like, it's like it, I I guess people could look at it as a cost saving move. To me, what this screams is searching for cap flexibility more so than a mandate of dollars needed to be saved. And I don't know. I've been driving back from Wisconsin. Maybe it is. Maybe that's what it's going to come out. When I've talked to people on the phone about this deal, I've been asking them questions about Dante DiVincenzo, Julius Randle, and Carl Anthony Towns. I haven't, you know, been... Uh, that's a whole weird topic because it's the whole ownership sort of mm -hmm. thing of who's even paying that bill. I don't even know. Um, but I don't, I don't see it as... I see it as a pursuit of cap flexibility to be able to make different moves rather than, um, you know, rather than some way to save hundreds of millions of dollars uh, down the line. Cause that's just not really like determined. I mean, get, get pissed. Sure. If you know, in a year, Julius Randall opts out of his player option, Nas Reed leaves an unrestricted free agency. Nikhil Alexander Walker leaves an unrestricted free agency. Mike Conley retires and you know, whatever your team's left with that, like, but that would, yeah, then they wouldn't even be in the luxury tax at all. Right. They might be below the salary cap at that point. Um, but it just, I don't, 
get the read at all that that's the path that that this is you know that this is this is moving down i think it's it's about being able to that's what the people i talked to the phone with was like this is about being able to keep the ant and Jaden and nas thing together too um, amongst the, the other pieces of it and you were going to get to a point where you were going to lose nas so um but yeah, a, like a real yeah. point right like let's just, let's just hammer that for there's like oh you were going to get again the timing sucks and you wanted to see everyone come back out there in game one against LA, the same group of guys that left you in, in Dallas. But there was a Nas Reed <laughs> biological clock ticking here that at some point you were going to, and this isn't like news, we've talked about this almost for a year, like you were going to have to choose between, you know, you have three bigs making a whole bunch of money. At some point you're going to have to choose to get rid of at least one. And they've mm -hmm. now done that. And it does increase the likelihood of retaining a guy like Nas Reed, who it does seem like fits this window more and is, you know, you have this tripod of Aunt Jaden and Nas. So I think, again, when you're trying to parse through all your feelings, you're so sad about losing that one big guy. But it's like, remember that other big guy that's been almost, you know, has another really cool story in this community. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd, you're so much more plugged in than I'm. I'd always heard that, like, and no one wants to. I'd always heard that, like, Glenn Taylor, because everyone's like, you know, he has paid the tax before, that he'll pay the tax. He just didn't want to pay, like, that tax, because that tax is pretty nasty. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, and, and neither did the Celtics, right? Like, that's right, the, yeah. the Celtics are being sold right now because <laughs> right. they're going to have, they're going to be a Glenn team that's... <laughs> yeah. Somebody, somebody don't need a team. Like, I mean, in all seriousness, like, the, these are, these luxury tax numbers are crazy. And, like, and... And I understand there's like some people out there like you had a contender. It's your job as an owner to to go and pay and compete and, and do all of those things. And I like generally feel that, too. I'm not I'm not like trying to protect the dollars in Glenn Taylor's pocket. That's like the last thing I mind. But like when I just turn off my brain and, or like turn off any sort of. I, I don't know, like. What am I trying to say? Influence or something mm -hmm. yeah. like it it doesn't make sense to be paying a hundred million dollar luxury tax bill year after year when you're when you would just be that was a, be a huge that'd be taking a loss of that hundred i mean that was would be losses of a hundred million dollars like yeah maybe if you won the championship you get a lot of that back from the revenue generated from the generated from the playoffs but not every year it would just be hundreds of millions of dollars in a negative like uh and 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 I I get that for the Timberwolves or the Celtics or for anybody if they're like yeah we didn't get into this to lose 80 million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that and I I don't know maybe some people think that's if you're rich enough to own a team like that's the way you should go about that but I I, I don't know the numbers are so big now. Mm -hmm. When when you're talking about 100 million dollars like this isn't a billionaire trying to save three or four million bucks right like it's, it's and yeah. there's a weird irony in when this took place last night because it also took place at the exact same time the twins were eliminated from the playoffs yeah but you know but i mean i and and i kind of this is this is the one area where i feel plugged in and i feel like i know i work in finance like i get some of this stuff i don't think this was like a poll ad thing like i don't think this mm -hmm. is just shedding salary to shed salary um because again whether it's glenn taylor or you know mark and alex someone's going to have to pay a bill, but it's not even about paying one bill. It's that that just becomes your new mortgage every year and it just gets right. worse and worse. And you you're losing pieces along the way. Like, yeah, like you're you just have like, this really nice house, but like there goes the jacuzzi, you know, there goes the pool, <laughs> like the big screen. Like it's, it's yeah, no. that's, that's, so, I don't, I get it. Let me, let me wrap it for a little bit. Or like, you know, I think we've talked a lot about Tim Conley and, and the, the risk that he has always embraced. And I think that is part of what makes him, I mean, how often do you see in any sport that you watch executives and stuff that just kind of always try, I mean, what a great job. It'd be awesome to be the president of basketball operations for any team. And I would probably be so risk averse that I would just try to keep that job as long as I could until they cancel my fob. But so we've talked about Tim enough. I think we've talked about Carl enough. What do you think Finch is thinking? I think Finch is thinking he can make this work. I do too. I, I think my guess, but I haven't talked to him, uh, but my, my guess would be, 
any issues he sees with the fit of Randall next to Rudy or taking the ball from Ant. I wouldn't say he'd, he'd be ignorant to the idea that the, those are issues, but if he was weighing them against the issues that Cat's presence provided, again, not because Cat's bad and not because Julius Randall's bad, but it was just always a wonky fit, right? Like Cat mm -hmm. and Rudy, yep. there's elements of it that was a wonky fit. We all watch the games. Like there's an element of the Cat and Ant thing that was a wonky fit. Like what were we talking about the other day? Ant had eight assists to Cat on pick and pops last year. Like those two didn't work well together offensively. Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Townsend. I don't even know if that's Cat's fault. Honestly, that's probably on like Finch and Ant more than anybody else. Yep. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't working. So I would imagine that where, where Finch is at in his head is like, hey, 48 hours ago or two weeks ago when I was talking to Britt, I had a whole puzzle that I had to figure out and we were putting the pieces together and I had some ideas and I shared them to you all, all here of how I was going to be able to do it. And now I think he's putting together a, a different puzzle right now that is the same amount of pieces and isn't like, I don't think it's like an expert difficulty level that, you know, that he feels like that, that he has to solve. I Oh, how do I build on the puzzle analogy? That was really good. I think the equation becomes more complicated and simultaneously easier to solve because I just, and I know that's like a tongue twister right there, but going back to the given the keys to Ant, I just think now if Rudy Gobert in that first year when they got rid of the dream shake and the post-ups and now he's humbled and he's just going to play defense, mm -hmm. I think Chris Finch literally only needs to appease one person. You know what I mean? And again, not that not that there was any issues or any of that stuff. But like he did have to find that balance of how do I make this work with Cat and Rudy or Cat out there and Ant. Like I think now, any position player that doesn't really fit and make Ant look good and help bring him to the next level, it'll be easier for Finch to just do mm -hmm. something with, pull him, sit him, change rotation. So yeah, I, like I, you wouldn't have to give him as long of a leash as you maybe had to give D'Lo like two years correct. ago. Because mm -hmm. Ant was 20 then, and now Ant is 23 or whatever, right? Like, yeah. he's, yeah, no, that's, that's, I think that's a good point. Um, okay, Finchy. Did I cut, uh, did I cut you off there? Sorry. No, 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 no. I just, I, I wanted, there's a couple guys that you have to throw into this pod. So, you know, Tim Conley, and now we've talked about Finch a little bit. But the one, can I, can when, I, sorry, can I say one yeah. more thing about Finch? And this is, I guess, just like a basketball thing too. Yep. I think, I think Finch also is going to feel like he solved a lot of his, Kyle Anderson and backup point guard issues in the addition of Dante DiVincenzo. And I wouldn't just some of that connective tissue defensively and offensively. I think DiVincenzo will provide that is now going to be absent without Kyle Anderson. Um, and then it, I mean, I wouldn't consider, I don't consider DiVincenzo like a point guard, but like that's another handler that you can put out there. Like you don't, now have to be, I mean, this team was going to be dangerously reliant on Rob Dillingham, a 19 year old point guard. This, the addition of DiVincenzo mitigates some of that risk and needing to navigate it uh, for, for Finch by getting deeper, which this, they definitely did with this trade. There's just less that Rob Dillingham has to do and more that it can be like, okay, let him pleasantly surprise us and will swell his role accordingly, you know, um, over time. I think, I think Finch is going to really appreciate the, just the DiVincenzo like roles that he can fill. Not even mention the quality of the player, the shooter he is and all, all of those sort of things, just like positionally, I think Finch is going to really like that. I, I would assume we will hear him rave about that, um, at media day on Monday. Okay. You took my thunder. So let's just build on that Sorry. because I, no, 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 in a good way, because I, when I saw the trade details again come in Friday night and you're going through all these emotions, one of my thoughts was, does this make the Dillingham move make less sense? Just in the moment, I was thinking it, right? Mm -hmm. And then whether it be <laughs> highlights on Twitter or just checking out his Wikipedia page or just like his, his stats and his height and stuff. And then I came around more on like that. This might make the Rob Dillingham pick make more sense because I think DiVincenzo can play alongside anyone. And I think he does give you def defensive resistance. I mean, I think he can play in the backcourt alongside Ant. I think yeah. he does solve your backup point guards now for Mike Conley. If back to the remaining parts of that Brit story that still hold true is like, Rob's probably going to have for every three nights, only one good one. 
Mm-hmm. So if you can just plug Dante DiVincenzo, who is a former champion and just a hooper, into that spot for those other two nights, well, now Kyle's June and July take of are they going to take a step back is like looks stupid because now right. you just are solidifying what to me is still the most important role on the team. So, yeah, the Randall thing is still going to be so fascinating because, you know, does he start? Like he makes a lot of money, right? But like, does he start or is it not? I'm, I'm assuming so. I mean, again, I, that's the piece I need to dig into more with all of this. But I would, yeah. I would. But I, I mean, you just you can do worse, right? For a team that went all in to try to try to win now mm-hmm. and all that stuff, than having Ant and Jaden and Rob Dillingham and Terrence Shannon Jr. and Dante Divincenzo. I mean, that is and Nikhil and some of these other young guys that have probably no chance now of playing like a Jalen Clark. So. Yeah, I think I think again when I woke up this morning, I kept coming back to like stop looking at the first name in the trade package just because that they ranked it by by salary. Yeah. I think the DiVincenzo piece is going to be the one. I think Finchie will make Randall and Gobert work, or Randall work at a small ball five, or all that stuff. But I think the DiVincenzo one is what gives them. I mean, again, mm-hmm. I know it hurts to lose quote unquote maybe the best shooting big man of all time, but they they might have brought in more shooting. In a weird way. Yeah. And I mean, that's going to be an important part of Randall and what is his willingness to play a different style? Like, mm-hmm. you know, but he's not going to be able to play the same style of basketball that he's been playing in New York for a while. But I think it is important to note that like Finch did coach him in New Orleans where he was playing a different, you know, a different style of basketball or might have an idea and some insight into Randall's willingness to, you know, to, to adjust and to be a piece that, you know, that, that can fit in. I I would assume they don't make this move without some confidence in Randall Finch, having confidence in Randall's ability to, to adjust for this or, or maybe not. And it's like you said, and he's just like some walking trade exception that they can move again down the line or whatever. But um, I would guess given the Finch Randall connection from the new Orleans time when they're both there, uh, that there might be a little bit greater b- belief in Julius Randle internally than uh, Twitter has about him, <laughs> you know, yeah. right now. I-, I think in many ways, like Randall and Cat are similar, have had similar like career arcs. Like they both have a handful of All Star games and All NBA appearances and stuff like that, while also being outly mocked often throughout their careers about what their shortcomings are. I think that's going to be the Julius Randle experience too, but that comes with the all-stars and the all NBAs and the, the positive things that that will come through it too. I think that's going to be the most like interesting basketball part of this is watching an extremely talented player integrate into the team that you cover or watch all the time, you know? Um, And it'll probably swing the trade and somebody will have a huge impact on this season, of course, of 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 how that you know of how it all plays out but um yeah i i just yeah i don't think finch is is viewing this as more complicated than the cat situation was not to say he this is going to be some sort of seamless transition um but it i don't know again i gotta look more at at randall and get my head wrapped around that uh, a little bit better i'm curious to hear what they have to say about it but I don't know. It, it it seems that people are a bit low on Julius Randle relative to what his actual value is, which we should know that how that works more than anybody. Cause that's what the whole cat experience has been like. Yeah. We all acknowledge like, yeah, there's some weird parts of having cat be one of the best players on your team, but there's also some like pretty damn good parts of it. And whenever I pull up basketball reference or cleaning the glass or whatever, the numbers next to cat always have a plus and a big number by it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I think, I think, I think Randall would be, should be able to to do something like that too, while also doing some maddening things or causing some spacing issues or whatever. They're going to, they're going to need to, they're obviously going to need to get like navigate that, but I don't know. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem possible to me. Uh, this is pretty important. I should add this in quick. Um, according to basketball reference, one of Dante DiVincenzo's nicknames official nicknames is the Michael Jordan of Delaware. <laughs> so, so you just want to write that one down. Uh, also the big ragu, which the big is ragu. that the pasta yeah. sauce. Um, I, I, yeah. So the, the, the Randall thing, I mean, you also have, I just thought of this like Randall, Nasri, Gobert, your whole front court is basically 
on a contract year now <laughs> again. So is there some yeah. heightened motivation there? We'll see. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think to kind of, I don't Man, know. Man, if I'm quote, Julius Randle, I'm coming into a situation where I have the opportunity off. to compete. <laughs> Yeah. To compete for a championship, right? If I if it literally is me and I'm like, okay, like, yeah, that with the Knicks, but at least I didn't get traded to Charlotte or Detroit or mm-hmm. something like that. Like, I'm on a damn good team with a coach that I know, um, and an opportunity. I, I I'd be sh- shocked if he doesn't have a real opportunity to, you know, be a main part of this, a main part of this team. I, yeah, again, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be fascinating. Um, Oh, I just was saying. I think my burning, my burning question now, if I can revise one, because I'm gonna still media day is still gonna be fascinating, if not ten times more fascinating. I'll be curious to just see, hear you call me after a game in November of like what the locker room is like, because me too. I, yeah. I think taking Carl out, who was a different type of leader and a different type of personality, and we've talked about that plenty, and now you remove a Kyle Anderson too. Yeah. There's still a lot of leaders in that locker room, but again, I. I come back to this face of the franchise phrase that it's not just about being on the murals or the billboards. It's mm-hmm. about you're kind of now the guy that everyone has to listen to and look up to. And that has never been more clear. There's a lot of unknown and gray with this team now moving forward. Mm-hmm. But one thing is black and white, and that is the Minnesota Timberwolves. While well, the ownership stuff is up in the air, they belong to Anthony Edwards. And yeah. this move was built around trying to keep his window open this season and be three wins better or 10 to one championship odds while also keeping the window open because it's going to be really good. It's going to be really exciting, but he is 23. And this whole window that we talk about is about him just at 26 to 28. And can you have the best pieces on the court to try to thread that needle? And this, this sounds like in their belief, this was that one move to try to get them closer. Yeah. And, and when Ant is 28, Nas Reed will be 30 and Jaden McDaniels will be 29. When Ant is 28, Carl Anthony Towns will be 34. Like that there is, was always an element of that, of like Cat was going to be out of his prime at the time that that Ant hit his. And Cat is a better player than Nas Reed and, and Jaden McDaniels. But the, I think there's something to that and like and and keeping similar windowed players like in like in stream together mo- moving along in, in in that sort of way and and I think this deal uh allows that to happen. I think man if they want to if they want to win over some like goodwill and get some reassurances let's get that Nas Reed extension locked in, right? Can can you do like you gotta wait till after the season? I mean, maybe Nas would just want to wait till after the season to to be able to really test the market and stuff like that. But that's the big thing. If if this trade very well could be Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, the Detroit first round pick, and Nas Reed for Carl Anthony Towns in in a way. And I know that's mm-hmm. a no, little gray, but like it it is. I I I do think it is very likely that Nas and or Nikhil. Uh, we're going to be gone if 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 cat wasn't traded now or at the deadline or or next summer. So um, they jumped on a time when they could get a positive asset return for Carl Anthony Towns. I know that's not the funnest way to talk about this stuff, but that's how they think about it. And I, I think I, I think it's it's something the wolf, it's a way the wolves had to think about it. And now we just got to like see how the chips fall, right? Like how how does Randall fit in? How does DiVincenzo fit in? How much do they miss cats three point three? All you know, all that sort of stuff. And that's what makes this stuff fun to actually watch play out. Like you said, like go to the games. Like I can't wait to track this team starting next week and training camp and learn more and have be able to like add more information behind this to you know to kind of figure out what I actually think about it. You know, I uh, let's let's wrap it up. I, I just want to confess to you, though, at the end of this pod that I did lie to you and the people listening to this earlier this week. Um, I wasn't really ready for the season again. I don't know. <laughs> I just I'm not I wasn't whatever. Um, and lo and behold, one of my favorite analogies just came true again last night. The Ricky Bobby Applebee's moment. Um, it feel <laughs> I'm just telling you right now we will grieve. 
And Carl will return in December for a Knicks Timberwolves game on a Thursday night. That'll definitely probably be promoted to TNT and there'll be emotions and we'll do a big welcome back. K to Bates D op package on the, on the jumbotron, but it feels fucking awesome to be hated again or to be doubted just from a, just purely from a fan standpoint, because everyone, I mean, for, for, a, for a Nuggets fan base and group that was like little brother, the Timberwolves for a long time, there was a lot of posts about how much better the Nuggets championship odds got last night for thinking that there's no rent in their heads. Like a lot of people think this is a bad move for the Wolves. And I think the Timberwolves act better and play better when they are just doubted. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the doubt now, whatever the odds say, whatever John Hollinger says, the national consensus will be on Monday morning and moving forward that the Minnesota Timberwolves have less of a chance now to pull this thing off than they did 48 hours ago. And I fucking love that. So I'm in. I love it, man. I also think the people making that analysis might not have a full understanding of the situation in Minnesota, whether that be just like the X's and O's of how it fit on the court. Yeah. Uh, personality dynamics and and all those sort of things part of this move was for that too of just like the pieces that ultimately didn't feel fit together correctly with carl anthony towns and i don't know maybe they thought that three years ago when they traded for rudy gobert and knew they were going to eventually need to you know get to this get to this point and, and and play the long game with it i think the pieces of cat and rudy actually fit better together than we maybe ever anticipated but did they fit well enough to win a championship? I think they answered that question to be no um, by, by making this this move yesterday. And, and again, and people can can disagree with it. Personally, I agree. I, I, I do not think the pieces on the roster fit well enough to win a championship next season. And I I don't necessarily look at the additions of Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo and say they the pieces look good enough to win a championship right now either. Um, but it gives me hope for the idea that that's something that could come when Ant is like 25, 26 years old. Um, and I think you ran a big risk of squandering that if, if things somehow went sideways with the with Cat and the, the Cat contract. So they mitigated that risk and... And we'll see. We'll see where the season goes. Obviously, like our predictions don't mean anything, right? Like we <laughs> like let's there, there's so much more, so much more to come and learn and see and uh evolve with this thing. Like organizations are like living organisms that constantly evolve. And uh the evolution is a is a is a cool thing to track, particularly when you have like Anthony Edwards at the, you know, at the the head of the snake. Uh, pulling this thing. So I'm fascinated to see what happens. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know you have like family in town to, to come to a long, a long podcast with me uh, here. We'll uh, Kyle and I are going to be Kyle's coming into Minneapolis on Monday for, for media day for whatever, whatever is about to happen with that. And uh, the two of us will have um, immediate reactions from media day uh, that, that will come out on, on Monday night uh, once those festivities are done. And uh can't wait but let's watch football tomorrow and like not think about the wolves for like 24 hours oh i finally have a good question now i can ask dante divincenzo how he became the michael jordan of delaware so look for that (laughs) hard-hitting analysis somewhere on youtube and spotify and apple uh late monday night but yeah i'm excited man 24 25 timberwolves i am now ready for it so uh it's gonna be a trip let's do it uh he's kyle tyke follow him on twitter at kyle tyke and listen to him uh with uh phil mackie on flagrant howls as well uh yeah until until monday after media day uh he's kyle i'm dane peace out how i'm feeling man i hope it never stop yeah green and hot so you can find me in the crowd yeah yeah don't let standards ever ever bring you down yeah